Welcome um, to um, the conversation today with uh, Maureen Abramovich. The artist is present here and uh, she brought some guests. So um, we're, um, we're having with us today uh, Patrizia Ocola, designer from uh, Milano. And um, we're having with us also Les Liebeskind um, from New York, um, architect. Um, and um, we're hoping to have uh, Patricia Moroso arriving, arriving. arriving um, on the way. So it will be uh, Patricia Moroso um, that will be hopefully joining us in second. She's the creative director of the Italian design brand Morosa. We're here to talk about Marina. And Marina, we want to know why are you here? Because, uh, Start the first. <laughs> Let's start with Gast. Uh, I think, I think uh, it's quite unusual to have um, um, Marina Bramovic here, not just for a talk, but actually for four projects in, um, in the city of Miami. We want to talk of uh, Marina Mania here. Um, and I saw your schedule, it's quite uh, amazing. So can you, can you tell us what, um, what you're presenting and what you're showing here in, in Miami? No, first of all, who is this working? Honestly, I, I hate Madonna. My is this working now? Yeah. All right. I first have to tell you, for an artist to be a nightmare, it's really not a good idea. It's a pure nightmare. You know, because artists, somehow it's very hard to see, an artist to see how actually the work is sold. And this is fair. But here I'm not for the, in the fair as an artist. I'm here as a representative of my institute, which is the MAI, Marina Bramovic Institute for Long Duration of Work of Art, which is really a very immaterial institute. And when I talk long duration of works, I'm not just talking about you know, performance, I'm talking about opera, I'm talking about dance, film, uh, video, uh, in all the you know, arts who actually are time-based. And you have to be in one place in order to see them, otherwise you miss. And they're immaterial because they're not like a painting. You just can't put the wall, you know, performance, or you can't put the wall, the, 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 the dance, uh, and then come next day and look, look and appreciate it. You have to be at the place what's happening. So it's really time-based and immaterial forms of art. But my institute also will deal with new technology and will deal with the science. So they are, it's a kind of merging into the ideas of the, what, what kind of art and what kind of life we're going to have in the next century. I'm so busy about big picture. I'm not busy just about picture of an artist you know, living his own life, but what are the good ideas or bad ideas an artist can leave after he died? So to me, technology is have a good sides and bad sides. I am not that I'm against technology because I think it's, uh, it's uh, invented for the human being to have a more time. But technology took all our times. Basically, we become completely, completely slaves of technology because we just don't take time for ourselves. So in a way, I decide in this institute to be the, as a part of the, all the different, um, the, the, how you call it, the program. I would like to create something that called Abramovich Method. This Abramovich method is based on the 40 years of my career as an artist, trying to do everything possible. Go to the shamans in Brazil, it's living with Aborigines one year in the Central Australian Desert, visiting all the deserts in the world, and so on and so on. And uh, really trying different methods in the different, uh, you know, the, the spiritual trainings in, in the different countries. So, this is a Tibetan bell <laughs> I, So, I create some kind of system which I work to me, and I really choose the most basic and simple ways that actually you can uh, claim time for yourself and concentrate and really go back to your own, to your own, um, you know, the, the, the body. So here I present, you see, we're in art fair. This is millions of things are happening at the same time. You're very busy, there's a party all night. You're constantly exhausted because you're constantly missing something here, missing something there. But here, you know, I, I came with these four different projects. And first, the, 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 Sam Keller was so kind to offer me a stand, which is just next to VIP lounge, you can go and see. And there we have, a, how many, 12 beds? We have, 12. we have 10 beds. And they're just the camper beds, nothing special. 
But what I'm proposing there, you go to, to this uh, stand, you open the safe box, you put your computer, you watch especially, and the telephone, and your belongings, you close it, and you go to the bed and the assistant will put you inside and tuck you with a little cloth uh, and the blanket, and then you have the headphones who block the sound. I have this, uh, you know, Japanese guys who come, they put headphones on and they say, but it doesn't work. It's exactly <laughs> what it is. It doesn't work. Because we, we are consumer junkies. We are constantly listening to something, seeing something, buying something. Here is really to empty yourself, to have the less as possible. So you don't hear anything. You just silence. You close your eyes and you can rest. And it's completely up to you. Five minutes, ten minutes. I have people coming out to the stand like three, four times a day today. There was a woman yesterday who had a really great nap of two hours. And then you wake up and you refresh, and you can go and see more. So this is on the end of fair. A part of this, in design the district, we open today rice counting tables. The rice counting tables are made with the liver skin too, in a combination with Morozo. We are very happy with these uh, rice counting tables because, again, rice counting is a so simple exercise. You're counting rice, but this takes forever. You know, you have the big amount, and you have to decide in your life how much you wanted to spend time. Are you going to count all the rice, which will take six hours or seven, and then in the middle of this counting the rice, you find out, oh my God, I'm crazy, I can't do it. But then you have this incredible feeling of failure. If you can't do the rice in, in, in a county, you can't do life either. So you have to really, before you start counting rice, you make a decision, say, okay, I'm just going to count a small amount. And then you stick to it and do it, and you finish, and you feel accomplishment. And in the process of counting rice, you can feel, angry, you can feel she's completely mad this around which what she's doing to me. Then you feel uh, bored, then you feel, uh, uh, you know, the satisfaction. And as the a, as a time goes, your body gets the same amount of oxygen for a long period of time, and you start calming down, and you start focusing. So it's not about counting the rice, it's about the process of your mind going through this counting the rice, that you can come to the state of peace and tranquility. Very important. So, uh, Patricia is here, also. <laughs> she done so much for the institute. <laughs> she's Italian and she's late, but we forgive her. <laughs> We're in Miami. <laughs> you know? Anyway, and then, you know, then the, the, the Mr. Lieberskin also, we have created, <coughs> we create a prototype. One, uh, the, this, the prototype actually who is addition of 30, and these are the tables were made out of the concrete. It's the really one block of concrete produced by Morosa, also for the mine. So these concrete tables are made for two people to count the rice. It's a great family present. You can do it in the garden, in the snow, you can do it in the rain, you can do it in any kind of weather, because Sufis say always the horse is the best. I also think so, because you, we, we don't have any experience if you do all these things we like. We have to do things that are difficult. And, uh, you know, so that tables, I hope that we're selling because that will be a great donation for the Institute that we can continue building it. A part of this, we have Patricia Kola, who and we asked if she could make a prototype for the long duration of chair. So we asked Patricia, we explained to her what is the long duration of chair. If you go to see long duration performance, a long duration theater, or anything in long duration, you have to sit comfortable. And you have to be able even to sleep. Sleeping is part of experience. So we wanted to have long duration chair with the wheels. And you can be moved around, and you can have the most comfortable position. So in the design, this we just crossed the street. We have the prototype on the concrete table and uh, and uh, and uh, her wonderful chair. She even found this fantastic blanket, which you have to tell me about because I just see that it really feels so good. And you you create your own home in this chair. So there, and then in June box in the in the young young arts of Miami, we have long uh, we have a slow motion walk. So you go there, you press elevator, you go to the third floor. It's completely quiet, and you can slow walk, and you can slow walk for a while till you really need it to center yourself. So there are all these four different exercises in the four different parts of Miami. That's it. Only <laughs> <laughs> So, what is really interesting and also reflecting in uh, the title of, um, of our talk is an art fair obviously is um, uh, a context 
where works of art are presented, so ob objects. Um, what you're just describing is not about, uh, about the object, it's about the experience. Um, where, where is the art um, ex exactly in, in, in this experience that people are going to make? Can you ask some more easy, because I can't close down. Can you ask some more easy questions? <laughs> no. You see, it's a very interesting thing. They are objects to have to have experience, immaterial experience. They're material objects to have immaterial experience. So, you know, in my performance practice, in the beginning, it was a very simple situation. You're the public sitting on the chair and me performing on the other side. But then, uh, this was 70s. Already 80s and 90s, I tried to change the structure because I understand that, that you know, why people should sit and do something, you know, like, be forced to work something it maybe doesn't want to work. Sometimes performance is very bad. It's not, you know, they're, they're not even interesting. But you can't leave because your friend is performing and you have to sit there. So it's not a good thing. So what I decide is you have this performance is happening, but the public is free to take as much time as they want. Five minutes, 20 minutes, come back if they want or not. So it's a free. And then an artist is present in, 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 a, in a MoMA and made this performance that actually uh, public uh, be not seen as a group, as an individuals. Performance was one to one, and you have the other people who can see, and they can take as much time they want. And now, in, in 512 hours in, uh, in uh, Serpentine, uh, the public become the work. Public need experience. I already had experience, but you don't. And you can't do anything with my experience. You can do only with your own experience. You can't change your life by reading somebody else's book. You have to make the journey. So this actually is shift. So the public is the art here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's very much about participation, and participation is so much also, um, also uh, important for um, this project you're doing yeah. for my. And maybe you, you can talk to us how it came, came that you had this collaboration um, to, to do the, the chair and the table. Which one do you want to start with? Story. And let's start with the, with the chair. <laughs> so, you know, first of all, Patricia Pola, she's a great designer, and I really love what she's doing. And uh, I used in my entire life, before I met Patricia, to have the most uncomfortable pieces of furniture in my house. I can't mention the names, but they're great objects, and they look great, and you can't sit on them, <coughs> and all my friends complain. And now, you know, till I, I actually, I, you don't even know this story, but recently I went to the Morozo shop and the Rami, our friend, she, he blindfolded me, he said, okay, close your eyes, you just sit on the four couches, but you don't see them. And I, I sit on one, two, three, four, and I sit on one, and I, I almost fall asleep. This was the most comfortable couch in my life. I opened the eyes, it was yours. So I think, my God, she is able to make something that is functional and that is friendly to the you know, human body, but at the same time meaningful. So please tell us about your you know, chair for me, designing for that. First, I... It's okay? Yeah. But first, for, for collaborating, even in a little thing with, with Marina, you have to have a, a heart, a little bit performer. And my mother, who was having lunch with me today, she was telling me, you were a performer already when you were two years old. I was sitting in, the, in my grandfather's uh, weekend house nearby the sea, and I was sitting very in an easy little chair, always, but a few times I was doing it in the summer, sitting there, looking for the flies, stuck, killing them, and then eating them. And then my mother was remembering that. I was saying to you, Marina, and she would say, you know, you are perfect for, for helping me. I understand. You, I said, okay, I can be a good assistant. I, can, I, I will try. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have the luck to, to know Marina through Patricia Moroso, which is, as you saw, Marina is always telling, is, is, I don't have to move. I, we have a problem here. Oh, ah, okay. Um, Patricia Moroso, which is, she's come, Marina comes from the sun. We know, you know, the, the lady from Brazil tell, told you. But Ma Patricia also comes from the same place, Echo. And uh, Marina is connected with the desert. And uh, I got lost in a desert with Patricia Moroso, and she was in delay. And I thought I would never come back, Echo. That was in Australia. <laughs> then, you know, that other lady, 
she made me meet the incredible Marina. We are always waiting for the energy she can give us, and I'm very happy to give her something. Echo. I don't know how she could use it, and I think it's a kind of uh, luggage uh, cart. It's a, a little kind of, of place that you can, you can move by your own. You move it in a place, then you take a rest, or someone can take care of you, like a baby in a stroller. I don't know, something like this. And the, and the fabric is the fabric of the sofa you have home. Then it's something I've done. I don't know. It's, you know, for me, for me, it's very important that the, the, the furniture have to be functional, but also have to be conceptual. And this idea that actually that chair is like your own, they can put together, but you can put your own belongings, and you can, like a gypsy, move from place to place. Mm -hmm. And then you're independent. And that's a very important part. And then you also have this cover. I mean, you're going to see in the design district, just go and, and use it and see for yourself. And that's really important. And then another important thing for me was the, all this collaboration with the, with the, your father. First of all, I met the Mr. Liberskin as a blind date. So how this happened? In, a, in a New York, there is a, this uh, film festival where they ask different people who never met before with each other, but they, they, they somehow they like to uh, they create this idea of blind date in the film festival. So I've been asked to choose four films that I like the most and only show three minutes of the, each film. And then Lieberstein was another, you know, the, the, the person in that program. He chose his four films. And we met first time just like this on the, in the front of audience. So I show my, my first three minutes, he showed his three minutes and so on. And there was incredible synergy and energy between each other. I mean, we are both Polish, you know, he's Yugo, ex Yugo, I mean, I guess Yugoslav, he's a Polish, he's somehow ex European, ex emigrants living in New York. And there's all these uh, stories, bad jokes, and, and uh, lots of fun, and really worked. His choose, his, his uh, uh, material he chose and me somehow, you know, connect to each other. And then just for pure pleasure, so let's do something. And I was talking about this rice county table. And then we start producing it. And, uh, and then the Patricia came and said, I can make it. And you know, it's a family business. You have to love the idea. And you have to put different people together to create something. My institute is not something that I can do by myself. It's all about teamwork. And if each of us do something together, we can realize it. And that's such a beauty. Maybe if you can tell us how we should imagine this teamwork to happen between a great artist and a great architect that only oh, meet on the panel. And I think it's the first major collaboration that you've done with an artist. So tell us about how that was going and what, what were the challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can, I hope the audience can. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored to be here on behalf of uh, Dan, my father, Daniel Liebeskid, and our studios, both in New York and Milan. Uh, and among friends, and great company. And really, the most fun is to see Marina and Daniel together. They share a particular kind of Eastern European black and dirty humor, which is so really, really a, uh, uh, unrepeatable and something that I, uh, is a really uh, fun pleasure to experience. So in a way, this collaboration really uh, was born out of friendship between um, Daniel and Marina. And also, it's as you said, it's a kind of family business because uh, Patricia, her family, the Morozos, like our family, are a business, and we work very closely together uh, as well with them. And the idea was to do something very simple and kind of um, almost, uh, how can I put it, not, um, it's not really a bench or chair. It's more like a church pew, and it has a kind of stark simplicity to it, which you don't really necessarily associate with Daniel, with, with, with Liebeskind, with his style. And that was really to pay tribute to this concept of counting rice, um, which is something that my father really loves because it's very close to his own architecture in the sense that it's like a sacred meditation but within a secular space. So you're doing something kind of, which has that kind of ancient charge to it of, of being, of, of something sacred, but yet it's not part of a religion or kind of any kind of theological context. It's just a kind of pure meditation. 
of moving these, these rice uh, and, and lentils or whatever it is um, and counting them. And so there is a kind of affinity there that Daniel immediately um, captured. And now we've done it in Milano. We had a great show with like 100 people in Geneva. Uh, and now here, and uh, hopefully we'll continue. And everywhere, everywhere we go, the kind of, these church pews are arranged differently. So you never get the same exact uh, experience of the space itself. And we now we've done it, thanks to Patrizia, in um, plywood in a very simple way. Then in concrete, which weighs tons, which is imprinted with a uh, pattern that Daniel designed. And I hope in the future to do it in other, explore other materials. And uh, yeah, all I can say is from my point of view, it's been a great, great pleasure. So, the, I love just the father of great humor. He said to me, his dream is to have just one piece of furniture, with, actually two pieces of furniture of him and his wife in the living room. I said, what it is? He said, the best. We don't need anything else except Lufthansa, the, the, the chairs from the, you know, the, the, the first class chairs, Lufthansa. This is it. If we have these two chairs in the room, we have everything. You can serve the dinner, you can look the TV, you can sleep. You don't need anything else. Everything is there. And then really consider it's not a bad idea at all. So maybe Patricia, you could tell us about this collaboration, especially also about the challenge to work with this material. Like concrete is not a very usual material to make, uh, to make uh, the design furniture. Of course, yes. Uh, the project started in another way. So it started as a, as a piece that was a unique piece, but done by modules in wood, so it's closer to us. And anyway, was not a problem to do something in our style. The answer, don't you hear me? It's better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it yeah. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. too much. Sorry, my ear is so Okay, done. It's better? Okay. So, uh, that thing was to make something for Maria. Of course, concrete is not the way that we usually do sofas. You, you can imagine, uh, but we have many suppliers, we have many contacts, and the company doing furniture is not that has to do inside everything, but is the, the network of uh, many different suppliers that you can have, and the experience that you can pass to the producers from someone else. So that was our role. So to keep the first piece as a piece there was a piece of furniture imagined in wood, but we were wanted to use a, a, a sort of special material to remember, in a way, the art world, because that material is commonly, commonly used for the boxes of the sculptures. So it's a, a very special kind of material. And, and we used that because it allowed us to make a big thing. In wood, I, I, I say massive wood, was not the, the, the correct material to do such a big thing and to be in a place like a, 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 a museum in, uh, in Geneva that is an old factory. So we study the place, the material, the reasons why all together and we find that the material suggesting to them, to Marine, and then when everyone was, uh, was uh, uh, okay with us, we start. Then, to make the special version for a unique uh, sort of number of edition to present in Basel, of course we, 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 we changed material to something that was a, a better material for a, a, a sort of sculpture, a unique small piece. So, what's better than concrete for an architect? And also because Daniel used a lot of that material in his, in his buildings. And so it's a sort of material that is in the middle between architecture, design, art. It's the perfect thing that links everyone to that. So that is, again, 
Maureen, um, every material has every material has its history and connotations. What what were you, were you thinking of when um, using uh, concrete? It's not a, a material associated with your work so much. What uh, what interested you in concrete? They told me, they didn't want to give me anything that had holding because it's better for video, you don't see the stuff holding it. But I have to hold, this is nice and minimal, okay. I love, I love holding microphones, I, I can't get this Madonna shit. Okay. Always gets away. <laughs> okay, now, you see the concrete is such an interesting material. It's, it's almost uh, somehow the, the opposite of what my work is, it's a material. But the idea of the object... <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I don't know. This, I'm old-fashioned. I like Xerox, Fox, Telegram, you know. I can't get to this whole new stuff. Okay. The concrete is almost a contradiction, but at the same time there is a wonderful contradiction because there is kind of sculptural element and it's really love that the people, you know, get this material and put it in the gardens and it's just that kind of resist to the entire, you know, the weather circumstances that you actually, you don't have any any reason not to count the rice as snow or not to write that count the rice as earthquake or whatever, it's always going to be there. Concrete is like a pyramid, it's there, there. And the one interesting thing about concrete, even if it's destroyed, still look good. And you have to think of the structures too. <laughs> so you, um, you, uh, you're often talking about um, energy, you know, energy that something is created. What kind of, um, of energy it, uh, did it give you to work on, on this project? You know, to me, as I said, it's a teamwork. It's a teamwork to, to create you know, material objects for immaterial exercises. This is what is the theme of this evening, I think. It's the most important to concentrate on that. And, uh, and it's just, uh, you know, all these exercises I'm proposing now, and all this very large participation in my projects for the public, I think this would be not possible 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we was not ready for this. 10 years ago, the world looked different. But now, we are so lost. We have so much less time in our life. And, uh, you know, there was this great, uh, great uh, guy who was, um, I always tell the same story, he was the Nobel Prize winner and uh, it was a dinner and he said on this dinner something that I'll never forget, he said to, to all of us, he saw the human brain for 30,000 years didn't change, but technology changed so much that our, we literally as a human being can't follow. The science fiction of, of 70s is, a, is a actually a reality of today. And if we don't go back to simplicity, we are lost. Otherwise, we become half robots. And that idea that we have to go back to simplicity is uh, really the most important thing. So it doesn't matter if we are using concrete, we are using the, the plywood, we are using whatever we are using to build. We, I call them transitory objects because they are not sculptures. They don't have value as an art piece, but they are incredibly important value as a, as a tools to get something out of these tools that you actually can connect with yourself. And once you connect to yourself, the tools you don't need anymore. So they are, for me, the tools. And, uh, and all the, it's as much energy you put in the tool is how the tool function. It's, you know, if you stay there and, you know, lie in this bed five minutes is one thing. If you stay three hours, it's different. If you just have a simple example that, you know, when I do those workshops, you, you take the door of the, of the own home and you start opening this door very slowly and you don't enter, but you don't exit but just the act of opening. And if you do this 10 minutes is one thing, 10, 20 minutes is another. But if you open this door for three hours slowly without going in and going out, the door is not the door anymore. The door is a space, is a cosmos, is something else. You transcend it to another state of mind. This is why we need long durational works because we, we need long durational actions in order to get to that state of mind because with the way we're living, it's not possible. So, um how are you concerned with, with time? You know, has uh, that, that project been, been uh, 
important for, for your concept of how to deal with time? Counting the rice has been an extremely successful project. We have the entire families coming with the kids who can't be two minutes without, without phone and texting and computers. They come in there with the father and mother, bring them there, and they sit there and for five hours they're counting the rice. And these kids sure. don't look for the, this, the electronics for five hours. This is your success to me. You've been thinking uh, about uh, what, what did it give you to, uh, to participate on this project? You know, for, for me, this argument about time is very important. I think make me make me think a lot. Like, I think Marina in, in this institute is asking us six hours minimum of our time, and she's giving us back our vulnerability. You know? I think she's giving us many things that I think they are very important. And I want to, I, she made me remember, we've done an, an exhibition where at the entrance I was proposing two doors. One was the normal door, and the other one was a fast track. You know, I would love that in your institute could be a fast track for people that they don't have time to lose, you know, no wasting time, then they can go inside, and in four minutes they have a panoramic of the place, and they go out immediately. And the people that they don't want to have a fast, a fast track for life, they can get inside, you know. Then I, I think uh, it's very important to think that we did it in the exhibition, and I was thinking, I hope people understand that from the use. When you did an exhibition, what was the use? How many people use fast track? Well, how many? I really want to know. What was uh, the ratio? Well, that was fantastic because when you were in the, in the track, in the corridor of the fast track, the other ones were seeing you. And there was, you know the divider that is normally in the airport? I got that, me, I'm not so afraid to that thing. Um, and the divider, you saw the people in the fast track always think it was a privilege, but the privilege was not, obviously. And then they were opening the, the crossing to the place. Then the first day, the, even the journalists, they went a lot in the fast track. And me, I was making a lot of fun. But they were making fun about it. They understood that I was provoking them saying, that's an exhibition, you don't need a fast track. Like, that's not a value. Then I, I, I hope everybody leaves the fast track for being in the institute. As we, with me, Patricia and me, 15 days with the armchair, stopping the production and, and playing with fun for you. I value. I'm the so value. grateful for the girls, really. But also Patricia worked with so many different artists and uh, and this is really, really rare. It's not just with the designers, but artists themselves. And they come with the most incredible ideas. And she's so open to accommodate and actually realize them. And this is why I'm so really grateful. So can you tell me, apart from our, our concept, do, can you tell me any idea or any collaboration with artists that was incredibly difficult or impossible or never been realized or anything strange that you have in this huge production? I like to know. Some mysterious, strange events. Just that we started with artists. Yes, me, me too. Okay, it's better. Um, so, but there are some in, in, in these years. I, I'm trying to work with artists or trying to add them to realize something. Um, just putting my company in, in the situation of the, how to say, the possible production of, of an installation or, or, or an idea. And I have to say that till now, the things that we that project, uh, projected, we also realize. Um, the first, first, the very first thing was with a young Chinese artist, Michael Lin. And uh, we have done a beautiful installation of a, a reproduction of a, um, Afghan carpet that was um, the, that kind of carpets done in the 70s during the, the, the war with, uh, with the Russian occupation in Afghanistan. And these kind of carpets are called um, uh, war carpets there. And they were produced only for that 15 years. So it's a very special moment in that country that war unfortunately never stopped. But that period, people that was living making carpets in the villages, on the mountains. They were protesting 
about the world because they had no other voices making the carpets in a different way. So putting in the decoration of the carpets instead of flowers, vases, that was that usual material that to, 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 to decorate the carpet, putting bombs, um, caterpillars, uh, kalashnikovs, and this, like, this kind of things. In a, in, a, in a very nice way, so with the red and the colors that they usually use. So Michael decided, because he is a sort of pop Chinese artist, to reproduce exactly, this, exactly that, the, the picture of, the, of the, um, the carpet, but in a very large scale, so like 10 meters by 8. And, um, and to put in the end of, of all that paint that was a symbol of the world, but from a side looking, uh, to put on it some design furniture that was our production, but covered with the flowers of the Chinese opera fabrics that are a symbol of peace and beauty. And so to show that that was a very special moment because it was 2003 and the war started, the, the first war in Iraq and so on, started that month. And so it was a sort of point, not to say A. Hey. And, but he, he said, I'm a Chinese, I'm used to beauty and, and harmony using flowers, so I would want to put flowers on the wall carpet. That was a project that I, when I hear, I said immediately, and we have done in two months, very, very running to, 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 to make it happen in the, in the, during the Milano Fair. So like that, every two, three years, I try to, to, to be the producer of an idea of someone. Tobias Rebergen was after that with another project. And um, Francesco Simetti, that is an Italian artist living in the uh, United States, in New York, and so on. And then we established a, a, an award, you know, for young, a young Italian artists. And so now we take care of them, basically. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and we are proceeding in that way. Because I think that is a little, a little thing that I wanted to say that it's a really a great, great honor to have art as a, a school of inspiration. What, what Marina asked us to the designer, to me, was in reality, it was a function. And so design is about function. It's about solving some problems in a good way, with, in, in, with a mind and thinking how to make the best for that, for that function. So I, I think that if your, your um, say, not client, but if the, the idea comes from art, is really a very special kind of request. And so me, I, I think, I, I am really honored to take on this kind of projects. And these are the first two, but we have idea to go on in that. Okay. Left. Uh, Sorry, I want to ask Sam Keller here something. Come on, let's change the roles. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur Keller, why are you doing all these things? I wanted to know. What is, I mean, you're the one who start art fair in Basel, then you turn to Miami, then you work with Craig Robinson, and you really believe on this, and you always look fresh even if you go to bed at 6 in the morning. <laughs> so tell me, what is, what, is your, what is your, what moves you? What is your, you know, the real purpose? I want to know. I guess I'm doing it to find out why I'm doing it. Uh, uh, Lev, I have a, a question. I know that uh, Daniel Liebeskin has also designed a museum. How is now collaborating with an artist? How is that influencing or maybe changing the, the way you're building spaces for art? Were there any, any experiences you made that are helpful? It's a tough question. Um, we've done, I think now we're on our 12th museum, um, and we've done shows with different kinds of artists inside these spaces, and I think it would be very interesting to try to do a long duration of Peace by Marina inside one of Daniel's spaces. I think you would, because in a way, architecture itself is a kind of long duration form of art, so there's a connection there, and um, 
I would like to see how, for example, some of the performances that Marina usually does in the quite um, kind of regular uh, uh, spaces of conventional museums, how they would change or mutate, because I think they would, within the more unusual geometries of uh, Libeskin design museum. Yes, Denver. <laughs> Let's plug the Denver Art Museum. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Marina, you're often talking about the charismatic space. Can you, uh, can you explain what you're meaning with the charismatic spaces that you're creating with your uh, performances? Wow. I, I just want to s kind of talk a can I, can I just not avoid the question, but get later to? But I just want to continue what he was talking about. This idea of architecture and how we can design something that actually works in architectural space and not in the museum and not in the, you know, in the public buildings. And I just have a, one experience who really was very important to me. And this was, a, this was a 12 years ago. It was a Trinale in Japan. And they invite 12 artists to go to the north of Japan, very rural area. And they brought, bring us to different villages. There was just the workers working with the rice fields. And they wanted that we talk about our project for the Trinale to each of these villages. And their villagers, who had nothing to do with art, should choose the project they liked very much. And I went to one village, which is 36 rice, really rice workers, just you know, doing rice in the fields. And I talked to them about the idea to build the dream house, like a dream hotel. And they listened to me, and they totally understood. You know, and they said, okay, we have a very old tatami house, and maybe we can renovate it for you, and you can use it for this project. And, uh, and I actually did it. I, it was only four rooms. You go in, you get headphones with the four languages, if you want, as a hotel to, to function, to explain you what you have to do. You get uh, your pajamas, you sleep there, and you actually, our only thing you have to do is to dream the dream. And then, register the dream in the dream book, and, uh, and that's it. And then after the, the Triennale was finished, so the exhibition was just three months, the all other projects been dismissed, but the villagers request the Triennale to keep this project for themselves. And to me, it was so important. It was the first time that I see the art project go into the life and function as a life project. So now, these people own the dream house, and they, they take care of it. And they're the first people, 36, who slept in the dream house to understand the dreams. And the dreams are such an important thing. We, we don't dream the dreams anymore. We're taking a, you know, dream, sleeping pills or television or we're drunk or whatever. But dreams are not something on our agenda anymore. And now, after 10 years of existence, we just made a dream book, which International Dream Collection. And when it was earthquake three, two years ago, they, 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 the house suffered some damages. They also repaired their own cost and so on. So to me, it was so important how the, the something which is art concept become the life concept. So to me, to create something in architectural existing spaces, it's a, almost part of, this, of the future ideas I have. Wonderful. Talking about dreams and your dream of, of my um, I think it was very interesting. We are unfortunately soon ha having to end the conversation, but would like to give an opportunity to maybe take uh, one or two questions, depending on how long your questions no, are. No, please. Two, two is not good, three, three is better. Three is better? Okay. But please, please questions and not statements. Who would like to ask a question? Okay. Here. You know, this is totally impossible to say now. First of all, I have to come to Denver to see the space. I have to see how I feel in the city, what the kind of quality of light, the architecture, the, the, my feeling about people there, and then the concept have to arrive from this. I will never have the concept here to tell you to, to go to, to perform somewhere which will be not fitting at all. I get ideas as a vision from the situation itself. You never invite me, so how I can know? <laughs> <laughs> You're officially okay. invited. Any other invitations for Marina for exhibitions? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm much more interested in somebody going to buy the, the table and help the institute. 
Yeah. Okay, there. There's a question here. Second. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing this. Can you speak uh, more in the microphone? Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Thank you for organizing this. Very insightful. Just quickly, I have a 17-year-old daughter who is very interested in the exploration of curatorial work and artwork. And um, I'm just wondering, given what you discussed briefly about the state of our youth today and being so into these phones and screens and things, what advice would you give her and other young people who are looking to enter this field? You know, it's always the same. First of all, for me it is very important when I, if I teach you know, art or what, whatever, you have to know, a young person have to know who he is. And that's the most difficult because there is so much doubts and so much adaptation and so much fashion going on. And you really get lose yourself in the choices. I really love this idea. You know, like in my country, which ex Yugoslavia, when you go to the supermarket, you have the three choices of the toothpaste the mental, the strawberry, and natural. And that's it. You come to America and you have the walls of toothpaste and you can't make a choice. So, can you imagine, young kid, how incredibly the, it's uh, confusing? The choices they have to make is everywhere and everything, and is bombarding them in every possible way. So the main thing is really to go into to himself and understand what is his purpose and what he really wanted to do. Did he really want to be an artist? Did he really want to be the curator, or want to be a writer, or want to be bread maker or gardener, whatever it is. But to find the purpose is the first thing because we're making so much wrong choices right at the beginning with so many different influences. Once you have the purpose. Then it's easy to advise. Thank you. Yeah. Last question, please, the microphone here. The gentleman, the gentleman with the hat. Hello. Um, I'm actually from the Northern Duchess Hudson area. And I'm really curious as to both the progress of your institute there. And you were talking about the dream house in Japan and how it's kind of became a, a life concept there. There's a lot of um, commuting from New York City up to Hudson now because of the art scene. And I'm interested as to what your ideas are of how you want it to progress and if you hope for that institute to become a local uh, kind of organization to affect the community in Hudson itself. Like how you see it in the future is I guess what I'm curious about. Wow, to me this is a real key question right now. This is a huge question because you know in the in the beginning of this whole thing I start to fundraise with Kickstarter because Kickstarter is so simple and uh, really works to understand the temperature of audience that they really need this institute or don't need and in one month we raised six hundred sixty thousand which is incredible they are all small amounts of donation one dollar five dollars six dollar twenty fifty and we have rewards who are all immaterial and uh, and then. If you want to donate the ten thousand dollar, which is the highest of Kickstarter, our reward is not to be mentioned, and you don't get anything at all. And that's really, and that's really important. And this is really important about that. You know, the people really understand that purpose is not important, not just their names and labels. So all the money went to the to the plants, the the, the architectural plants of Rand House, who is who actually give us this plans to build the institute. The only thing that the, to build this institute now we are we we are in, in incredible trouble because it's 31 million dollar. I can't I can't make in my lifetime you know 31 million. I'm not Jeff Koons who sell the world for seven million. You know I sell just the photographs. It's not this easy. So I find out that we have to go to plan, you know, the much smaller the, the idea. So my plan is to raise just the three million in the beginning to really create a very simple building and to have the, 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 the how you call it, the model of the as utopia, as a one day we we'll maybe make it. But at the moment it's more important to work with community than just looking for that money. So uh, the next thing that I wanted to do is that no any artist ever done is to create workshop for the whole city. The three months to actually entire city can be part of that community workshop and institute completely for free. Once we have the building just to clean up because we have asbestos, we have to raise seven hundred thousand dollars for the removing asbestos and we can move into building and all this. And the community 
they have to actually be there, they have to support us, and they are the ones who are going to actually take care of this building once they're not there anymore. So to do this, they have to go through, through this whole process, and, to, and I'm willing to do this workshop for the entire city. So this is what I try to do. And uh, really, the idea of this like, rice counting table and what we are trying to do is all to create this, this amount of money that we can actually uh, be able to offer the institute as soon as possible. So that's what I have to say. Thank, thank you for your question. And thank you for your participation. There's nothing more beautiful than helping and contributing to realize dreams, especially great dreams of artists. So all of you, if you find a way to, uh, to help and, and, and contribute, that'd be wonderful. If you want to ex experience and participate in uh, Marina's projects, you can win a move in the area where she's going to have her institute or you have here in Miami for possibility to do so, please uh, take advantage of it. Not a joke? I, I have to just say the last word, and just the most important. The most important thing that I, I, I have to say concerning your, your question is uh, that you see Hudson. Hudson is a small city, but they have the same problems as in New York. There is a problem in the community of the poverty and, uh, and the, you know, the rich, the poor, there's the racism, there is a crime. The, every single thing that you have in New York, you have it in Katsu. To me, if I can create this workshop for the community and do anything that I can change the consciousness of the community, we can create actually a model society that can be, you know, serve for anybody else. This is a big question, big story to tell, but I want to try because it's easy to criticize how things are not working. But on the personal level, we have to do what we can do. Thank you.